minutes to my friend and colleague from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, who is the sponsor of this resolution. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, this chart tells the story. We have had a number of opportunities over the years to pass balanced budget amendments to the United States Constitution. It's not my idea. It's not a new idea. But as we've gone through time, we've managed debt. Now, as the, as the chairman just noted, in the last 15 years, the debt has tripled. But looking ahead, this chart, which shows the ratio of our debt to our gross domestic product, and shows that by 2080, it will be nine times, nine times the total economic output of our country indicates that what some on the other side have said simply is not the case. Congress has not made the tough decision. We have overpromised the American people, and the fact of the matter is now we need to have something in the Constitution that the American people expect and demand of us, and that is a balanced budget amendment. Now, we have lots of different balanced budget amendments that have been proposed in this Congress. I think 18 of them that I've seen thus far. And some ask for more stringent requirements, which I very much like, limiting the ability to balance this budget by putting a heavier burden on the American people through taxes, uh, capping the amount of money that we spend, certainly something that I also think we need to be cognizant of. Others have said, Let's take certain things off the table, like Social Security or capital spending or um, uh, disaster spending. This bu balanced budget amendment, which passed this House with 300 votes, including 72 Democrats, strikes the right balance. It enshrines in our Constitution the principle that we should live within our means, but gives future Congresses the flexibility to, in times of national emergency, have some years that are not balanced. That, I think, is a reality that we have to deal with. But the fact of the matter is that in the last 50 years, since 1961, this Congress has balanced the budget of this nation six times in 50 years. It should be the other way around. There are certainly six years in those 50 that were crises in which you might say, we should not balance the budget this year. But when the gentleman from New York says that in good times we should pay down the debt and in tough times we should borrow, that has not been what has happened because most of those 50 years have been good times. Now, there's another important point to make here. Any amendment to the United States Constitution has to, by its very nature, be bipartisan. It requires a two-thirds majority. And many of my friends on the other side of the aisle have worked very hard to build support on their side of the aisle for this. I especially want to thank Peter DeFazio and Jim Cooper. But many members, the Blue Dogs, have endorsed this balanced budget amendment. But it is necessary to have a bipartisan approach to this. And you know what? This is a bipartisan problem. There have been Republican presidents and Democratic presidents, Republican Congresses and Democratic Congresses that have contributed to those 44 years when we've run deficits. So now today we come and ask for a bipartisan solution to this problem, a solution that, depending upon the poll, 75 to 80 percent of the American people supports. Congress continues to prove it cannot make the tough decisions on its own the budget has only been balanced six times in 50 years. The American people know what it means to balance their budgets. They are surprised that the Congress does not have this requirement. State governments do 49 out of 50 states, most of which have it in their constitutions. Local governments have to balance their budgets. Families and businesses have to live within their means, and they can't go more than a few years without living within their means. But to run up a $15 trillion debt, which divided by the population of our country means that the average person today owes more in debt based upon their share of the government's debt than they have in personal income is a disgrace. This is not only an economic issue. This is not only something that we should be imposing uh, upon future Congresses for economic reasons. This is also a moral issue. This is wrong 
to borrow money year after year after year, over a trillion dollars in each of the last three years, so that today the average dollar spent by the federal government, 42% of it, by far the largest share, is borrowed against our children and grandchildren's future. And where does that lead us? It leads us to where Europe is. I thank the chairman. This chart shows government debt as a percentage of GDP for five European countries and the United States. Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, and Greece. When Greece first got into their problem last year, they were at 120% of GDP. That's what their debt totaled. Already, just a little over a year later, it's 152% of GDP because their economy is shrinking because of irresponsibility on the part of their government. The United States just this week crossed the 100% line. The United States owes as much in debt as we have uh, the total economic output of this nation for one year. It is time to put a halt to this, and the best way to do it is to enshrine in our Constitution a principle we all understand, we all live by, and that is you cannot live like this. You cannot live beyond your means year after year after year. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join this bipartisan effort to enshrine in our Constitution a principle sought by the vast majority of the American people, and I yield back the balance of my time. time of the gentleman has